He left off. Mm. I think we finished paragraph 13 and we're moving to paragraph 14 regarding title. Does that sound about right? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> All right, paragraph 14, title, survey, and cost. Within blank days, seven if not specified. This was a change in the agreement of sale. Um, actually, it says a that this happened. And this is something people got to pay attention to. Here's why. It's a very short period of time from the execution date to be ordering title, or short's the wrong word, um, quick. It's a quick time frame to order title. Now, most of our home inspections are done in 10 days. So they're saying, well, listen, you've got to order title in seven days. That's awful quick. Here's the reason I would suggest you alter that to a minimum of 21 days if you're basing this on a 60-day closing is that there are title companies that would charge if you cancel an order. And so for that reason, ordering it seven days after the execution is a little early, especially since we haven't gotten through the agreement of sale, gotten through the home inspection, which we all know is the biggest hurdle we've got to jump over, right, initially. So I would suggest if this is a 60-day closing, I would alter that to 21 days, but put this in your tickler. Whatever form you're using once you have an executed agreement of sale to remind yourself that that's got to get ordered within 21 days. From the execution date of the agreement, buyer will order from a reputable title company for delivery to seller a comprehensive title report on the property. Upon receipt, the buyer will deliver a free copy of the title report to the seller. When the buyer and buyer's agent get a copy of a title report, they must deliver that to the seller. <clears throat> there are times when they're up on the title report on the seller side. Regardless of hiccup or not, this must always go to the seller. Buyer is encouraged to obtain an owner's title insurance policy to protect the buyer. An owner's title insurance policy is different from a lender title insurance policy, which will not protect the buyer from claims or a tax on title. Owner's title insurance policy come in standard and enhanced versions. Buyers should consult with a title insurance agent about the buyer's options. It's an additional cost for an enhanced version, of which this is over our pay grade, and this needs to be explained by a title officer to your buyers if they are interested in an enhanced version. Buyer agrees to release and discharge any and all claims and losses against the broker for buyers should buyer neglect to obtain an owner's title insurance company. On a region, and even when that happens, it would happen on a lower cost property. Investors on occasions will choose not to obtain a title insurance. How foolish are they? I don't even know where to begin on saying how foolish they are. Inevitably, on lower price property, the chain of title is often in disarray. For economic reasons, owners have transferred title from one sibling to another, to a child, to a, a spouse, not necessarily done correctly, not necessarily recorded correctly, and inevitably, this becomes a real hang-up in clearing title. And then we find that there was actually a lien against the property, but that buyer was quite sure of themselves and chose not to purchase title insurance. Extremely foolish. If you are dealing with a buyer, and this would only happen on a cash transaction because 
mortgage companies will not allow a buyer to purchase a property without title insurance, that if a buyer wants to purchase a property without title, I'm highly recommending you add an addendum to the agreement signed by the buyer that you have informed them of the necessity to purchase title insurance, but the buyer has chosen not to. That piece of paper will be very handy in a court of law. Buyer will pay for the following, title search, title insurance, and or mechanic lien insurance. Does anybody know what mechanic lien insurance is? Okay. Mechanic lien insurance is an additional insurance policy that can be obtained by a buyer for mechanical, meaning vendors. This is done on new construction. I will tell you, it is very difficult to get and you have to have full cooperation with the developer. The developer has to supply enormous amount of documentation and not all developers are willing to do that for a title company to obtain mechanic lien coverage. It's for up to six months post finishing of a project. If a vendor has not been paid for their services on a new construction, they can attach a lien to the property. Mechanic lien coverage is there to protect that property's title. Very difficult to get. If you're dealing with new construction, though, you should have a conversation with Go Abstract about this and find out if it's feasible to obtain with that particular developer. Or any fees for cancellation, flood insurance, fire insurance, hazard insurance, mine insurance, or any fees for cancellation. Appraisal fee and changes paid in advance, excuse me, and charges paid in advance to a mortgage lender. Buyer's customary settlement costs and accrues. Any survey or surveys required by the title insurance company or the abstract company to prepare an adequate legal description of the property or the correction thereof will be obtained and paid for by the seller. Any survey or surveys desired by a buyer or required by a mortgage lender will be obtained and paid for by the buyer. Does anybody know in regards to surveys in Pennsylvania, is that a customary thing that we do in Pennsylvania? Or surveys of a parcel, customarily very good done in Pennsylvania, that's correct. We do not do surveys in Pennsylvania unless there's a hiccup, unless there's a problem, or there needs to be defined the true meets and bounds. The property will be conveyed with good and marketable title that is insurable by a reputable title insurance company at the regular rates, fees, and clear of all liens, encumbrances, and easements. Accepting, however, the following, existing deed restrictions, historic preservational restrictions or ordinances. That will follow deed after deed after deed. Building restrictions, ordinances, easements of road, easements visible upon the ground, easements of recording and privileges or rights of public service company, if any. If any of you have ever read a deed, you oftentimes, under the description, will see a little blurb from PGW, a little blurb from AT&T going way back in time, or PICO, in regards, they have a right of way, and under that parcel's ground, or wires, or piping, that is made available through that um, municipal service. In the event of a change of seller's financial status affecting seller's ability to convey title to the property 
on or before the settlement date or an existing or extension thereof, seller shall promptly notify the buyer in writing. Any changes in a financial status included, but not limited to, the seller filing for bankruptcy, filing for a foreclosure lawsuit against the property, enter of a monetary judgment against the seller, notice public tax sale affecting the property, and seller learning that the sales price of the property is no longer sufficient to satisfy all liens or encumbrances against the property. Can somebody explain that last sentence to me? Or what that may be known of as, and seller learning that the sale of the property is no longer sufficient to satisfy all liens and encumbrances against the property. What's that called? When the property and the sale of is not going to satisfy the, the remaining balance of the lien against the property. Anybody know that? It's what is known as a short sale. We haven't heard much about short sales in the last 18 months. It's really slowed down in comparison to where it was. When you hear short sale, it means this, that the cost that is owed out for the property for mortgages or judgments or tax liens and etc., supersede the profits coming in from the sale of the property. So another term you'll hear people say, it's underwater. Oh, that house is underwater. It's upside down. There is more owed on the property than the value of the property. So that last sentence is once a seller realizes that they're upside down, that has to be made public knowledge to anyone interested in purchasing the property. And there are many caveats to that. So if you ever go on a listing and somebody says to you, listen, I got to get the hell out of here. I, I owe more than it's worth. Oh, you got a short sale. Know enough to know, you don't know. Pick up the phone and call somebody. There's particular paperwork and issues that have to be addressed with banks. The bank is going to make arrangements to accept the property's payoff at a particular price under to what is owed. And so you have to work with the bank along with the seller. You need three signatures, the buyer, the seller, and the bank in transactions. So it becomes complicated. Know enough to know, you don't know, and ask somebody. Okay. If seller is unable to give good and marketable type, title that is insurable by a reputable title insurance company at the regular rate, as specified in paragraph 14E, buyer may terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller, with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. Upon termination, the seller will reimburse the buyer for any cost accrued by the buyer for any inspections, certifications obtained according to the terms of the agreement and for those items specified in paragraph 14C, 1, 2, 3, and paragraph 14D. The reality is, if a seller cannot give clear marketable title, the buyer can request reimbursement for such items. It's a bit of a challenge to get it, but technically you could ask for it. H talks about oil, gas, mineral, and other rights of this property may have been previously conveyed or leased. And seller makes no representation about the status of the rights unless indicated elsewhere in this agreement. Now you'll note there's a little checkbox there and it's called oil, gas, and mineral right addendum, which you would need to add if this property has oil, gas, mineral, or other rights to the property, what are we talking about here? 
And where might you run into a situation where this may apply to a property? Now remember, this is for the whole state of Pennsylvania, this form. So where in Pennsylvania might we run into some of these oil, gas, or mineral rights? Tyler, do you know? No? Okay. How about in the Poconos? You've heard of fracking, correct? So that has to deal with oil, gas, and mineral rights. So if you accidentally find yourself in the Poconos representing a buyer, you have gotta find out for sure if any of that applies. The next paragraph I talks about cold notice, clearly is not something we typically deal with, but again, if you're up in the Poconos, this may be a paragraph that does apply and only were applicable, so we're not going to go and waste our time with any of that. Um, again, it talks about that it's not a recreation cabin, but if it is, we have to deal with that in J and K, the property is not subject to a private transfer fee obligation. And it talks about if that's the case, how we act on that. It does say, which defines a private transfer fee as a fee that is payable upon the transfer of any interest in real property or payable for the right to make accept or accept the transfer if the obligation to pay the fee or charge runs with title to the property or otherwise find subsequent owners of the property. Clearly, this has to do with deed transfer. I have never ever seen it. I'm not familiar with it, but apparently does apply in situations. Paragraph 15, notice assessments and municipal requirements. In the event any notice of public and or private assessments as described in paragraph 10F, excluding assessed values are received after the seller has signed the agreement and before settlement. Seller will, within five days of receiving the notice and or assessment, provide a copy of the notice and or assessments to buyer and will identify buyer in writing that the seller will A, or number one, fully comply with the notice and or assessments at seller's expense before settlement. If seller fully complies with the notice and or assessment, buyer accepts the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement or not comply with the notice and or assessment. If seller chooses not to comply with the notice and or assessment or fails within the stated time to notify the buyer whether seller will comply, Buyer will notify seller in writing within five days that the buyer will comply with the notice and or assessments at buyer's expense, accept the property, and agree to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement, or the buyer can terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller, with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. Now, under notice and assessments, what might be the first thing you think of if I use the term special assessment? When might that and what type of property might that apply to? Anybody here own a condominium? It applies in condominiums. That's run, correct. Yeah, I, I run to it quite frequently. Right. So, with that said, years ago, I'm going back in time, maybe 15 years ago, there was a special assessment placed on the Hopkinson house in regards to the windows. And there were properties that were under contract. Price based off, I believe it was price per square, um, of which every owner had to pay an additional fee 
to cover the replacement of all the windows at the Hopkinson house. And so that became a nightmare in that the seller was like, oh my God, I almost snuck through. I had 30 days left before I closed, but now what do I do? Most people, not always, are reasonable in that there was some sort of an agreement made if they were going to closing. Did the seller take full responsibility? Did the buyer and seller perhaps negotiate a percentage split on the additional cost owed to the association for the special assessment? Or did the buyer themselves absorb the additional cost for um, the windows? So that's something we frequently see regards. Perhaps it's a new um, heating system for these condominiums if they are uh, condo supporting that they do all the heat it's not per unit it's not like a heat pump in every unit kind of a thing or maybe it's a huge air conditioning situation maybe the pool is in great need of repair and so the cost factor to repair the pool and refinish the pool and do whatever maintenance is needed these are things that come up um, Maybe I know at the um, Independence Place had a huge issue with their garage, underground garage, needed extensive amount of work. So these things do happen, and that's where generally we find a special assessment type of situation. Okay, so we go on to B. If required by law, 30 days from the execution of this agreement, but in no case later than 15 days prior to settlement, seller will order at seller's expense certification from an appropriate municipal departments, disclosing notice of any uncorrected violations of zoning, housing, building, safety, or fire ordinances, and or a certification permitting occupancy of the property. If buyer receives a notice of any required repairs or improvements, buyer will promptly deliver a copy of the notice to the seller. Which, that last sentence is a little odd to me due to the fact the seller's agent or the seller is getting this first, so I don't know. But what are we talking about here in this? What municipal thing are they even talking about? Ah. Municipal Department Disclosure Notice. We're talking about a use and occupancy, which we obtain for properties that are already in existence, or for new construction, we need a CO, Certification of Occupancy, confirming that the city here in Philadelphia, or the county, or the municipality, has agreed that the property is habitable. It has all the right stuff in it, so that someone can live in there. So a use and occupancy is important. Have property sold without them? Absolutely. Wouldn't necessarily recommend that, and depending on some mortgage companies may or may not allow that on a resale, to have a property sell without a use and occupancy. The use and occupancy on an existing building will show if there's violations against the property. One of the main things that we customarily find is of illegal use. It looks like a duplex. It has two doors to get in. It has two gas meters, two circuit breakers, two water heaters, two boiler systems for heat or a hot air systems. But it's not zoned as a duplex. That property is of illegal use. And that would be then identified in the use and occupancy when it was ordered. So, A, if you're a listing agent, first off, I highly recommend you use our transactional coordinator who does this every single day. She's fabulous. And for a very small fee of which you're going to obtain from your seller if you're using the broker fee, um, and that's gonna pay for it for you, is gonna be in a timely fashion ordering this and making note that, whoops, we've got some hiccups on this. So 
Something to keep in mind, it's important that you have all that. Within five days of receiving notice from the municipality that repair or improvements are required, seller will deliver a copy of the notice to the buyer and notify buyer in writing that the seller will A, make the required repairs or improvements to the satisfaction of the municipality, so in the city or Bucks County, wherever you're at, if seller makes the required repairs or improvements, buyer accepts the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement or not make the requir required repairs or improvements. If seller chooses not to make the required repairs or improvements, buyer will notify the seller in writing within five days that the buyer will A, accept a temporary access certificate or temporary use and occupancy certification agreed to release in the paragraph 28 of this agreement and make the repairs at buyer's expense after settlement or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. If buyer fails to respond, within the time stated in paragraph 15B, 1B, and we see that's five days, or fails to terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller within that time, please note this is now capitalized. Buyer will accept the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement, and buyer accepts the responsibility to perform the repairs or improvements according to the terms of the notice provided by the municipality. Again, your job, representing the buyer, you've got to keep on top of that listing agent to make sure they have ordered and they have up to 15 days before closing to do it. And then keep after them so that you get to see it. Because if there's violations, we got to figure out what we're doing. Provide we talk before. Um, well, you have to have within that five days a plan. That's what we're talking about here. So if you know there's violations and it's proven in the UNO that comes through, there are violations. The seller has five days to come up with a plan. Even though you've zigzagged back and forth at the end of the fifth day, you guys have to figure out what you're doing and or you're going to need an extension in writing, right? Everything's in writing. There's no shake hands here. Okay. Uh, if repairs, improvements are required and seller fails to provide a copy of the notice to the buyer, as required in this paragraph, seller will perform all repairs, improvements as required by the notice at seller's expense. I strongly recommend you put a little star there because I guarantee somewhere you're going to need to refer to this. You're closing on, let's pretend, tomorrow. Tomorrow's the 16th, I believe, right? Okay. And today, you get the use and occupancy. And there are issues. Or you get this, um, or you forget to ask. Totally forget to ask. That happens. And all of a sudden, post-closing, it comes through in an email, and there's all these bumps and bruises. It also says here, paragraph 15B2 will survive settlement. That means post-closing. You can now go to the seller and say, oh, listen, you need to perform all this. Clearly, this is going to end up in litigation because it's post-closing, perhaps, and that seller's not really going to care, but you at least need to know where it's at in the agreement of sale to refer back to it, okay? Next is condominiums plan community. This agreement is based on the assumption that the property we're speaking about on page one that identifies the who, the what, the where, the why, and the how is not a condominium. So it says property is not a condominium are part of a planned community unless checked below. Condominium. The property is a unit of condominium 
that is primarily run by a unit owner's association. Now this is known as a 3407. It's very important you understand these terms. People in the industry are going to say, oh, this is a 3407, not a 5407, and we'll talk about that as we go on. But you need to understand what the heck they're talking about. The 3407 is the Uniform Condominium Act of Pennsylvania requiring sellers to furnish buyers with a certificate of resale, the Resale Act, and copies of the condominium's declaration other than the plots and plans, the bylaws and the rules and regulations of the association. When I first came to Keller Williams, there was a situation in that property went under contract. It was a condominium. The listing agent sent over to the buyer, uh, excuse me, I'm going to correct that. The condo association sent over to the buyer via email the 3407, but they forgot to send over the bylaws and the rules and regulations. Now there's a time frame on this, and we'll talk about that in the next paragraph. When it was realized that the bylaws and the rules and regulations did not go over to the buyer in the appropriate time indicated, the buyer got out of the contract. You need to educate your buyers and have them forward to you so you can see to make sure, what do they know? They're not the professional here, right? So when the association sends over um, the bylaws, the rules and regs and et cetera, you wanna be CC'd on that is my opinion, so that you confirm they got everything that they need to have received. Therefore, when the clock is ticking, they truly have all the documents required. Same as a POS, I don't know what a POS is. The POS is the public offering statement. I can't hear you, sweetheart. I'm sorry, um, the public offering statement? When it's oh, no. Well, yes, we're going to talk about that. That's when something is a brand new condominium that's never been introduced. This is its first exposure, and we're going to talk about public offering statements, okay? When you turn the page and you're now on page 11, we have an option for in a little box as a planned community, also known as a homeowners association. The property is part of a planned community as defined by the Uniform Planned Community Act, known as a 5407. So your condominium was a 34, this is a 5407. Of the act requiring sellers to furnish buyers with a copy of the declarations other than plots and plans, the bylaws, rules and regulations of the association, and a certification containing the provision set forth in the sections of the 5407 Act. So again, this is information that the potential buyer needs to obtain. Couple thoughts on that. There are many large companies that manage condominiums. Um, with that said, if you're dealing with a condominium of two or three units, which would be considered quite small, right? A big brownstone was converted. They illegally made it condos. Somebody's going to be a president. Somebody's going to be a secretary or whatever. It's very concerning when you have to deal with an individual over a company to whom is handling the condo association. It's very fearful and concerning that is the president of that small condo association sending over all of the documentations that are required. Here's a big question mark. Perhaps, voted out two years prior to your buyer entering into an agreement that they were not going to allow any more pets, any more dogs. Perhaps accidentally on purpose, that addendum was not included in the bylaws and regulations. 
Pets are a huge issue with people. It's their family. How horrific to find out you bought a condominium and you can't bring your dog there. There are many guidelines for pets. If you are a listing agent, and this is what I personally have done to cover everybody's dupa here for me, when I've listed a condominium, condominium regarding pets, I go to the association and I have them scan an email to me the part of the bylaws that indicate the interpretation of pets. So there is no misunderstanding. I get it right from the association. Different associations have vast difference of opinion. The number of pets, the size of the pets, the breed of the pets, it goes on and on. There are some associations that are extremely strict, mandate a letter from the veterinarian who is the main primary vet of that doctor to indicate the type of breed of the animal, the size of the animal by weight and by withers. Those of you who may not know a lot about dogs, the wither is not the head, but the shoulder. That's technically how dogs are measured at their shoulder height, it's called the withers. And so these are things that certain condo associations mandate. As a listing agent, you better have your stuff wired right when it comes to pets. So for me, I've protected my interest and that of the seller by mandating I get those very particular pages directly scanned to me and I include them under documentations in the multiple listing system along with perhaps, you know, the lead-based painter of the seller's property disclosure statement. So there's no hiccup about pets because that can be an ultimate nightmare, okay? So we have to really be cautious about pets. And I'm going to get off my soapbox about that one. All right, now, under B, the following applies to initial sales of property that are part of a condominium or planned community. And this is where the public offering statement comes in. Oddly enough, this paragraph was removed a few agreement of sales ago, which made absolutely no sense to me. And the only place that this was found was in the new construction agreement of sale. Finally, Harrisburg realized not all new construction agreement of sales are drawn up on a new construction agreement of sale. So they put it back in as they should have. And it says, if this is the first sale of the property after creation of the condominium or planned community, therefore the sale by the declaration, seller shall furnish buyer with a public offering statement. No later than the date buyer executes the agreement of sale. Wow. That's interesting, right? I will tell you, probably 70%, if not higher, it is very difficult to get the public offering statement at the time you're writing the offer. It's unfortunate because the developer, along with the listing agent, were way too hasty in getting this on the market without having proper documentation. Many years ago, when I was working for Berkshire Hathaway and I taught for all of Center City. A young lady from the Rittenhouse office was one of my students. And she had a buyer who purchased a two-unit condominium. And at the time she was writing the offer, she said to this listing agent, I need the public offering statement. Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. It's always don't worry about that, just so you know. Don't worry about that. We're going to get that right out to you. Let's just get that offer in. She was a smart lady, and in the agreement of sale, she wrote, and this is a time when we used to do first and second deposits on a regular basis, that the second deposit would only be due five days after the buyer had obtained, reviewed, and signed off on the public offering statement. Every week, that developer asked for the second deposit. Every week that young agent would refer to the agreement of sale. It took almost two months to get the public offering statement. 
And there's a reason for that. The public offering statement is sort of like a boilerplate type of condo docs. It's very basic and has some interesting terms in there that may or may not be acceptable to a buyer. So you get the opportunity as a buyer to review them. So it's very important that we get them. Not always are you going to get them as indicated here in the agreement of sale. Buyer may void this agreement within 15 days if it's a condominium or within seven days if it's a planned community after receiving the public offering statement. So the buyer gets 15 days to look over the, the public offering statement and the seller gets 10 days. I'm telling you, public offering statements have been reviewed at the settlement table. That's how short of a time period that they were given. Not right, but that's how it happens. Right at the table, that buyer could walk if these terms are not acceptable to them. Or any addendums to the settlement that materially or adversely affect the buyer. Upon buyers declaring this agreement void, all deposit monies will be returned to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. This is like the ninth time in the agreement of sale it says, don't worry buyer, you're gonna get your money back. Remember how many times we talked about that? Those words are very cavalier on how it really plays out in getting deposit monies back. Now, we have a few co-ops in the city. It's either three or four, I apologize. I don't remember which it is, but of which they too have rules and regulations. 3407 for condos, 5407 for your homeowner association, and it's called a 4409 for a co-op. So that's another type of animal and it's handled very differently. We happen to have in our company a young lady who, who has created her own niche and is quite experienced in co-ops. She came from New York City, I guess maybe three years ago, four years ago now, and found it very difficult working in Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania realtors are very much on their own and are much more, in my opinion, knowledgeable about the whole transaction because we don't generally have attorneys involved and it's our responsibility and our agreements of sale are already printed out without attorney review and et cetera, right? So she struggled with this. And then it dawned on her because she had moved into a co-op. Why don't I specialize in co-ops? She has created a wonderful niche for herself and does quite well. If you are in a situation where you're either going to be the listing agent and or have a buyer interested in a co-op, please reach out to me and I will ask if I can pass her name along to be a, a sounding board on how we do this because it's handled even quite differently than that of a co-op is handled quite differently from a condominium or a homeowner association. Okay, so at least we have someone to reference to. C, the following applies to the resale of a property that are part of a condominium or a planned community. Within 15 days of the execution date, seller at seller's expense will request from the association a certification of resale and any other documents necessary to enable the seller to comply with the relevant act. The act provides that the association is required to provide the documents within 10 days of seller's request. Huh. So let's see, realtors can't do math. We already established that on class one, right? So from the execution date, what is the longest period of time, if you read that sentence, that it could be before the buyer sees any of the paperwork for a condominium. Twenty-five days, thank you. Someone does math well. Twenty-five days according to 
the agreement of sale. It could be before a buyer sees their condo docs. With that said, if you have a cash transaction under 30 days, it's very possible your buyer is not going to see it until they get to the table. Hence the conversation I had before. There are those at the settlement table who are previewing their condo docs. Okay, so keep, keep that aware. It then says, seller will promptly deliver to the buyer all documents received from the association. Under the act, seller is not liable to the buyer for failure of, a, of the association to provide a certificate in a timely manner or for an incorrect information provided by the association in the certification. The act provides that the buyer may declare this agreement void at any time before buyer receives the association's document and for five days after. So now we know it could be 25 days before the buyer gets to see the docs. And at that time, the buyer then has five days to review the docs or until settlement, whichever occurs first. Buyer's notice to seller must be in writing. Upon buyer declaring the agreement void, all deposit monies will be returned to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. If the association has the right to buy the property known as a first right of refusal, and the association exercises that right, seller will reimburse the buyer for the cost accrued by buyer for the inspection and certifications obtained according to the terms of the agreement, and any costs accrued by the buyer for title insurance, search, mechanic lien, insurance or any fees for cancellation, flood, fire, hazardous mine insurance or any fees for cancellation, appraisal fees and charges paid in advance to a mortgage lender. Does anybody know what a first right of refusal means in that paragraph? Condominium has a first right of refusal. Some of them have the ability to do that with their documents on the 3407. It'll state whether they have the first right of refusal or not. Correct. So you have to be sure that when you're working with a condominium, if you don't know, to call the association and find out if that is included in their 3407. Right. So we would apply, obviously, to, well, obviously, it's probably not the, it would apply to an individual unit. And I would assume, one should never assume, but that would especially apply to something that may be of mixed use. It could be uh, a commercial piece on the first floor that that condominium's desperately been waiting for somebody to leave, sell it, of which they've always wanted that unit. So if that seller did not make this known, if that buyer's agent didn't know enough to know, and with that said, um, finds out post the association that this buyer, secret squirrel-like, either as a FISBO or whatever, was selling that, that particular unit, and that particular unit had a first right of refusal, then the association can act on that. And of which the reimbursements would be at the seller's cost because they didn't share that information with the condo association. If the, okay, so we read that. Real estate tax and assessed value. This paragraph 17 is nothing more than making the buyer and sellers aware of something. It's sort of a statement paragraph. In Pennsylvania, taxing authorities, known as the school district and municipalities, and property owners may appeal the assessed value of a property at any time of sale or at any time thereafter. A successful appeal by a taxing attorney may result in a higher assessed value of the property and an increase in property taxes. Also, periodic countywide property reassessments may change the assessed value of the property and result in a change in property tax. 
This general kind of statement is in here. This actually happened. Uh, hmm. This month I've been, oh, today, matter of fact, May the 15th is when I came to KW. This is my fifth year. Came here in 15. How about that? Hmm. Um, with an agent called me up, a very good agent, and said, I got a problem here. The taxes were raised on this condominium and the buyer was trying to get out of the agreement, though the buyer did qualify. And referring back to this paragraph, enabled the seller to keep to their guns and the buyer not to get out because of this. So when reassessments happen, the question is, if the real estate taxes exceed or jump tremendously, like 20 years ago, or 17 years ago, whatever it was, that the taxes went crazy in parts of the city, such as Queen Village, it threw buyers out of their qualifying. This is a blanket statement to identify because taxes have changed. If you still qualify, that doesn't mean you're going to get out of this contract. It's sort of a matter of fact statement that's given. Maintenance and risk loss. Seller will maintain the property, including but not limited to the structure, ground, fixtures, appliances, and personal property specifically listed in the agreement in its present condition, normal wear and tear accepted, exempted. If any part of the property included in the sale fails before settlement, seller will repair or replace the part of the property before settlement or provide prompt written notice to the buyer of seller's decision to A, credit the buyer at settlement for the fair market value of the failed part of the property as acceptable to a mortgage lender of any. Huh, what does that last little part of the sentence mean where the comma is? As acceptable to a mortgage lender. How does a mortgage lender get involved with this if it's a dishwasher that breaks. Ah. Credit the buyer at settlement for fair market value. Exactly. Sellers assist. If your buyer is maxed out on sellers assist and you get to the table and the dishwasher is not functioning and the seller wants to give a credit, the issue is that may throw the buyer over on their maximum seller's assist. That's why there's that little caveat part of the sentence as acceptable to a mortgage lender, if any. Not repair or replace the failed part of the property and not credit the buyer at settlement for fair market value of the failed part of the property. If seller does not repair or replace the failed part of the property, or agree to credit buyer for the fair market value, or if the seller fails to notify the buyer of the seller's choice, buyer will notify the seller in writing within five days or before settlement, whichever is earlier, that the buyer will accept the property and agree to release in paragraph 28 of the agreement, or, Terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer. I was doing that from memory there. Um, in paragraph 28 of the agreement. If by, or paragraph 26 of the agreement, excuse me. So that's the 11th time. Don't worry, buyer, you're going to get your money back. If buyer fails to respond within the time stated in paragraph 18B3, or fails to terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller within that time, guess what? Buyer will accept the property. Here we go, people. If you find deficiencies, you better go back to your agreement of sale and figure out what your timeline is. And what am I supposed to be doing? Because if that buyer goes underground and you're wrapped up in that buyer scenario, and doesn't do what's indicated here in the agreement of sale, your buyer ends up buying this hook, line, and sinker with all the bumps and bruises. 
and agree to release in paragraph 28 of this agreement. Seller bears the risk and loss from fire and other casualties until settlement. Thank God in 33 years, this only happened once to me. Just remember, your buyer goes past that property. God knows how many times that they're going to purchase within that 60 days. Sure enough, it's a few days before closing and my buyer on a single family resident calls me and said, oh my God, Vic, what happened to the garage door at the house? I was like, uh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> What's the matter? He said, the garage is melted. I said, okay, let me get on the phone. I reached out to the listing agent who happens to be an excellent agent. And she said to me, yeah, I was calling you today, Vic. I said, okay, what happened? She said, well, we think what happened was somebody flicked a cigarette out of a moving car. It landed on the leaves in front of the garage door. And they started a fire. The Philadelphia Fire Department quickly put it out. It did melt the garage door. I said, okay. And so we made arrangements on how we were going to move forward with this. And here are the options that are already pre-printed in the agreement of sale for that. Accept the property, the buyer will accept the property in its current condition together with the proceeds, if any, that the insurance recovery obtained by the seller. So the insurance company is going to take care of this and those monies would go to the seller would then be going to the buyer or terminate this agreement with written notice to the seller with all deposit monies returning to the buyer according to the terms of paragraph 26 of this agreement. There it is again. 19, home warranty. At or before settlement, either party may purchase a home warranty for a property from a third party vendor. Buyer and seller understand that a home warranty for the property does not alter any disclosure requirements of the seller will not cover or warrant any pre-existing defects of the property and will not alter, waive, or extend any provisions of this agreement regarding inspections or certifications that buyer has elected or waived as part of the agreement. Buyer and seller understand that a broker who recommends a home warranty may have a business relationship with a home warranty company that provides a financial benefit to the broker. Home warranties can be obtained right there at the settlement table. Oftentimes are. Paragraph 20, recording. This agreement will not be recorded in the office of the recorder of deeds or in any, of, any other office or place of public record. If buyer causes or permits this agreement to be recorded, seller may elect to treat such act as a def defect of this agreement. Now, the first thing people are going to say was, what are you talking about? Deeds are recorded. Yeah, this isn't talking about the deed. You got to take your time and read it. It's actually talking about the agreement of sale. You cannot record the actual agreement of sale is what they're speaking of. Assignments. This agreement is bound upon the parties, their heirs, person, personal representatives, guardians and assessors, and to the extent assignable on the assigns of the party hereto. Buyer will not transfer or assign this agreement without the written consent of the seller unless otherwise stated in this agreement. Assignment of this agreement may result in additional transfer tax. You have heard of um, a form of business that's called an assignment. I'm going to assign this property. It's legal. There are agents in our company who do this on a regular basis and are very good at assignments. But note, it has to have written consent for the seller. So I'll give you a quick example. An individual has an opportunity to purchase a property under market value. 
They're purchasing it for 100000 Needs a ton of work. But they know, not for nothing, they really got a good deal on this, and could easily resell it for 120000 The buyer makes arrangements for the, with the seller that they're going to purchase the property as an assignment. Seller says, okay. And then that buyer resells it before the buyer went to closing to another party for 120,000. The first buyer makes 20,000 at closing. So it's a profitable way of doing business. It's all legal, but that seller technically has to approve the second buyer. And that's where things sometimes get a little fuzzy because what if the second buyer is not of quality and doesn't really have the 120,000 to come to the table with. That seller made a business decision and signed documentation based off the first buyer of 100,000. So that's why it is legal and it's done frequently and we have particular agents in our office who have a livelihood of doing it this way and do very, very well. Um, if you find yourself ever involved in an assignment, know that you don't know. Know enough to know you don't know. And come find me and I will refer you to some of the agents in our office who are quite skilled at this so they can help guide you. Governing laws, venues, personal jurisdictions. The validity and construction of this agreement and the rights and duties of the parties will be governed in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The parties agree that any dispute, controversy, or claim arising under or in connection with this agreement or its performance by either party submitted to a court shall be filed exclusively by and in the state or federal court sitting in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That means we have to play by all the rules. We got to play by the city rules, the state rules, and the federal rules. Foreign investments. This paragraph has to deal with people from other countries, foreign persons, as it identifies here, are subject to the Foreign Investment Real Estate Real Property Tax Act. This has to do with taxes to be paid to the IRS. That's what that whole paragraph's about. Notice regarding convic convicted sex offenders known as Megan's Law. The Pennsylvania General Assembly has passed litigation, often referred to as Megan's Law, providing for community notification of the presence of certain convicted sex offenders. Buyers are encouraged to contact the Municipal Police Department or Pennsylvania State Police for information relating to the presence of sex offenders near a particular property or to check information on Pennsylvania State Police website, and they give the www.pameganslaw.com. At any given time working with buyers, you can have a buyer ask you, do you know if there's any sex offenders around here? How do you answer that question? Wow. I guess nobody's going to answer that. That's exactly right. You're going to give them the site address, the PA Megan's Law. You have no authority to comment on that. But please go to the police department and or what is indicated here in Megan's Law, the website, so you can do your own investigation, right? Representation. All representation, claims, advertising, promotional activities, brochures, or plans of any kind made by the seller, broker, their licensees, employees, officers, or partners are not a part of this agreement unless expressly incorporated or stated in this agreement. This agreement contains the whole agreement between the seller and the buyer, and there are no other terms, obligations, covenants, representations, statements, or conditions 
oral or otherwise of any kind whatsoever concerning the sale. This agreement will not be altered, amended, changed, or modified, except in written acceptance of all parties. Now, this next sentence here, pay attention. Paragraph 25B. Under the circumstances we are in right now, it says, unless otherwise stated in this agreement, buyer has inspected the property. Bold letters. Agents or writing offers sight unseen. That should be stricken because the buyer did not inspect the property. I have spoke to many managers, brokers, when all of this has been going down. And I've yet to find someone new that this was in here. Not that I'm that fabulous, okay? But my face is in this agreement of sale every other month detailed line by line with you guys, but it's in there on a daily basis for other issues that rise. So, note, if you're writing an offer, sight unseen, that should be stricken down. Strike it in dot loop. Your buyer did not inspect the property, including fixtures and personal property specifically listed herein. Before signing this agreement, or as waive the right to do so, and agrees to purchase the property in what kind of condition? Even bigger bolder letters. It is pre in its present condition. All real estate is sold in its present condition. By doing inspections or certifications, allow a due diligence period for a buyer to find, if any, bumps and bruises. But it's already established that the buyer is purchasing in its as-is condition. Subject to inspection, contingencies elected in this agreement, buyer acknowledges that the structural soundness of the property the age or condition of the components, environmental conditions, is permitted use or of conditions existing in the locale where the property is situated, nor have they made any mechanical inspections of any of the systems contained herein. Any repairs required by this agreement will be completed in a workmanlike manner. In a workmanlike, which is one word, manner. Four, four words. They are the most loosey-goosey four words I've ever seen, let alone in this contract. Had a long conversation with an agent this morning who's running into an issue. They, the seller, agree to the 10 things on the reply to home inspection to have them repaired also gave a thousand dollar credit at the walkthrough the buyer brought the home inspector which technically was not allowed but we're not going to go there right now of which <clears throat> the home inspector pointed out to something specific he feels was not done correctly the seller had used all licensed and insured individuals it was the opinion of the home inspector this is supposed to have closed 10 o'clock today. Haven't heard any more words. I don't know what's going on. But I did remind the seller that the term workmanlike manner is in the agreement of sale. It's in there twice. And to the seller's best of knowledge, it was done in a workmanlike manner by a professional licensed and insured. So, Work on a property oftentimes can be interpreted by other professionals as good or not good. So just something to keep in mind regarding inspections. Let's look at paragraph 26 that I refer to every single day of my life. Where buyer terminates this agreement pursuant to any rights granted by this agreement, Buyer will be entitled to returning of all deposit monies paid on account of the purchase price, pursuant to the terms of paragraph 26B. And this agreement will be void. 
Termination of this agreement may occur for other reasons, giving rise to claim by buyer and or seller for deposit monies. Regardless of the apparent, excuse me, regardless of the apparent entitlement to deposit monies, Pennsylvania law does not allow the broker holding deposit monies to determine who is entitled to the deposit monies when settlement does not occur. Broker can only release the deposit monies if this agreement is terminated prior to settlement and there is no dispute over entitlement to the deposit monies. A written agreement signed by both parties is evident that there is no dispute regarding deposit monies. Or, if after broker has received deposit monies, broker receives a written agreement that is signed by the buyer and seller directing broker how to distribute some or all of the deposit monies. Or, according to the terms of a final court order. Or, according to the terms of a prior written agreement between buyer and seller that direct the broker how to distribute the deposit monies if there is a dispute between the parties that is not resolved. Buyer and seller agree that if there's a dispute over entitlement of deposit monies that is unsolved, and note that there's a blank there, and it's determined 180 days if nothing is altered in that blank. I'm going to suggest you alter that 180 days with either 30 or 60. If not specified after the settlement date indicated in paragraph 4A or any written extension thereof, or following termination of this agreement, whichever is earlier. Then the broker holding the deposit money will, within 30 days of receipt of a buyer's written request, distribute the deposit money to the buyer unless the broker is in receipt of verifiable written notice that the dispute is subject to litigation and mediation. Paragraph 26 eats my liver every single day. This paragraph has some gray areas in it and is purposely designed to have gray areas in it. Because I am the broker of record, I deal with the distribution of escrow monies all the time. And as a fiduciary relationship I have with the seller, since extremely high percentage, probably 98, 99% of the time, the brokerage who represents the seller is to whom holds the escrow money. I have a due diligence to that seller. I have to notify that seller once I've received a letter that the buyer is exercising their option for paragraph 26 of the agreement of sale. I have 30 days to release that money. I wait 30 days because I need to find out if the seller is going to pursue this. A lot of times people calm down and so they can't be bothered with the nonsense. Will not they being the sellers go any further and agree to release the estimate of uh, the escrow monies. But on occasions, I will receive a phone call from a seller that says, don't you dare, don't you dare release that money to that buyer. Of which time, I throw my hands up and go, okay, everybody seek legal counsel because I'm not going there. I have to, Remember the integrity of the brokerage. There are cases that we've been dealing with over $100,000 worth of deposit monies. That's a lot of money. So I can never be found in default that the brokerage in default for this. So I am very rigid and I just don't give up monies. I have buyers screaming at me on the telephone. 
Um, I've developed thick skin and I make it very clear that I am not altering what I deem the way to do this. Now, in the eyes of a buyer reading it, it states, one, that I'm not the one to determine who should be getting the money, and B, I have 30 days to return the monies, regardless. That regardless is what I kind of hold back on. I've spoken to paralegal more times than I ever want to admit to in regards to this and other real estate attorneys. I'm willing to take the risk to find in a defaultment of myself for not returning the money in the 30 day period if it's taken longer because I have to protect the brokerage. But note, it's not easy, it's difficult. There's actually, and it shows here four, but there's also a fifth way that deals with new construction on how deposit monies can be predeterminately divvied out or then given to a developer as part of payment, but that's a whole separate animal. Generally speaking, we have three things we can deal with that has it happens. Mutual acceptable agreement of terms. The termination and return of deposit money form, which is a two-part form. The top form of the top part of the form identifies that this is a termination. And the buyer is terminating the agreement of sale based off of what paragraph? Often it's paragraph 12 or 13 dealing with inspections. Sometimes it's paragraph 14 that has to deal with title issues or any other paragraph that may apply. The second half, which is the bottom half, identifies how much is the deposit money and who is to get it. So when the buyer is filling this out, clearly they went on the money back. Now, the seller has to agree to that and sign. If the seller signs, that the thousand, the 10,000, the 50,000, whatever the number is, is entitled to go back to the buyer and the seller signs it, mazel tov. I agree to it and everybody gets, the buyer gets their money back. Or perhaps the buyer and seller have agreed that the buyer is gonna get eight out of the 10,000 and for the seller's aggravation, they're taking 2,000. That happens, okay? Long as everybody agrees and signs off, we can disperse the money as indicated with no issues to the brokerage. But when there is no mutual acceptable written agreement, now we have a problem. Now, somebody has to appeal that through dispute resolution. That is done through GPAR. And the paperwork is on the website sometimes a little challenging to find. So I would recommend that you call GPAR and you ask to speak to Cheryl and she will guide you through the website where to find dispute resolution. Whomever starts the process, there is a $50 non-refundable fee for. Professional mediators are hired. It's a $500 fee for a professional mediator which is divided equally between the buyer and the seller. Sometimes professional mediation works and sometimes professional mediation doesn't work. It's pushing three years now that I was involved with an agent from our office with $130,000 in escrow and the professional mediation didn't work and it went to court. So that's the next one. Court ordered, who gets the money? When a court order comes in to Keller Williams, Philadelphia, we must comply with the court order. So it becomes extremely complex. Yeah, I know. There's like 11 or 12 times it's going to say in the agreement of sale, don't worry, Mr. Buyer, you're going to get your money back. See, it says it right here. No, not so easy, okay? And this is the point I'm really driving home with you. You need to protect your buyer's money. Be selfish in giving up your buyer's money due to the fact it's a challenge in getting it back. Okay. If buyer receives verifiable written notice of litigation. Oh, I said all that. Okay, we move on. 
Buyer and seller agree that the broker who holds a deposit, deposit monies pursuant to the terms of paragraph 26 of the Pennsylvania law will not be liable. Yeah, I know it says it, but I consider myself liable. Buyer and seller agree that if any broker or affiliate licensee is named in litigation regarding deposit monies, the attorney fees and costs of the broker and licensee will be paid by the party named in the litigation. Seller has the option of retaining sums paid by the buyer, including the deposit money should the buyer fail to make additional payments as specified in paragraph two. That's often a mindset of a buyer. Let's pretend you write the offer and you give $1,000 good faith, which you guys know my opinion on that. And then in 10 days, you're gonna give a second deposit. Let's pretend 12,000. But your home inspection has a 15 day contingency and you're realizing this property really has some bumps and bruises and you're not sure you guys are gonna to come to a meeting in the mines. Your buyer says to you, wait a minute, Vic, I don't wanna give my 12,000 until we figure out what we're doing here with this agreement of sale. Ha, guess what? That buyer's now in default. You better make that very clear to your buyer. By choosing not to send over your deposit monies as agreed upon here in the agreement of sale, you will be in a default situation. Complete information to the seller, their broker, or any other party identified in the agreement concerning buyer's legal or financial status, or violates or fails to fulfill and perform any other terms or conditions of the agreement. Unless otherwise checked in paragraph 26G, seller may elect to retain those funds paid by the buyer, including deposit monies, on account of purchase price, or as monies to be applied for seller's damages, or as liquid damages for such default. G, check that box. Seller is limited to retaining sums paid by buyer, including deposit monies as liquid damages. If the seller retains all sums paid by the buyer, including deposit monies as liquid damages, pursuant to paragraph 26 F and G, buyer and seller are released from further liability or obligation of this agreement is void. Broker, and licensees are not responsible for unpaid deposits. Mediation. In the Pennsylvania Agreement of Sale, the first place we have to go is mediation when there is a dispute. There are attorneys who are quite sure of themselves and decide we're going right to court. No, it doesn't work that way. They have to back up and they're going to have to do mediation. I know they sound quite positive and quite sure of themselves, but that's not how it works. Buyer and seller will submit all disputes or claims that arise from this agreement, including disputes and claims over deposit monies to mediation. Mediation will be conducted in accordance with the rules and procedures of the home seller, home buyer dispute resolution system, unless it is not available in which case buyer and seller will mediate according to the terms of the mediation system offered or endorsed by the local association of realtors. Mediation fees contained in the mediation fee schedule will be divided equally among the parties and will be paid before the mediation conference. This mediation process must be conducted before any party to the dispute may intimate, indicate legal proceedings in any courtroom with the exception of filing a summons if it is necessary to stop the statute of limitation from expiring. So it says here, before you can seek any legal proceedings, you gotta mediate. It's already built in the contract. Any agreement reached through mediation and signed by all parties is binding. Any agreement to mediate disputes or 
claims arising from this agreement will survive settlement. Releases. Now, this is paragraph 28 that has been referred to many times in the agreement of sale. Buyer releases, quick claim and forever discharges, the seller, all brokers, their licensees, employees, and any other officer or partner of any one of them, and any other person, firm, corporation, who may be liable by or through them, from any all claims, loss, or demands. Included, but not limited to. So that first part, you're like, what the hell is this buyer releasing? Well, what they're saying is they're releasing anybody who has been part of this, included but not limited to, personal injury and property damages and all the consequences thereof, whether known or not, which may arise from the presence of termite or other wood-boring insects, lead-based paint hazards, mold, fungi, indoor air quality, environmental hazards, any defects in the individual on-lot disposal system or deficiency on the on-site water service system or any defects or conditions of the property should seller be in default under the terms of this agreement or in violation of any seller disclosure laws or regulation. This agreement does not deprive the buyer of any right to pursue any remedies that may be available under the law or its equal. This release will survive settlement. So what this is saying is that Mr. and Mrs. Buyer are of age. They have been given the option to have all these type of inspections or certifications done. If they chose not to do them, if they chose to do some but not all, and there is a deficiency found, they can't come back to seller, broker, their licensees, employees, all these people and say, hey, how come you told me I shouldn't do that? How come you didn't force me to do that? Eh, they're all grown up. They had options to do it or not. Real estate recovery fund. A real estate recovery fund exists in reimbursing any person who have obtained a full civil judgment against a Pennsylvania real estate licensee or licensee's affiliate. Owning to fraud, misrepresentation, or deceit in a real estate transaction, and who have been unable to collect the judgment after exhausting all legal and equitable remedies. And for more details, they give a 717 Harrisburg number. This fund is made available when a licensee or a licensee's affiliates have been found guilty. So they took the $1,000 good faith money that was given to them by the buyer. And instead of sending it over to the listing office, they go to Sugar House where their friend cashes the check and you put the thousand dollars on black and red comes out. Not good stuff, right? But not everyone is a good person. So that's why this fund is made available for such things. Communication. This is an important paragraph for you to understand. Communication with buyer and or seller. If buyer is obtaining mortgage financing, buyer shall promptly deliver to broker for the buyer of any a copy of all loan estimates and closing disclosures upon receipt. See where it says here, copy of all, all loan estimates? This is the estimate of closing I'm highly recommending you turn over with your offer to the seller. They need to see the estimate of closing costs. And you're like, yeah, but why? Why? Because if the estimate of closing costs says that the buyer needs $12,000 to be able to purchase this property with acquisition and closing costs, yet the BFI shows that they have 8,000, clearly we're, short to close, right? We don't have enough money. This is why I say to you, use the loan estimate from the loan officer rather than bright. Whenever this agreement contains a provision that requires or allows communication slash delivery to a buyer, that provision shall be satisfied by communication slash delivery to the broker for the buyer of any. 
except for documents required to be delivered pursuant to paragraph 26, excuse me, 16. If there is no broker for the buyer, those provisions may be satisfied only by communication delivery made by and directly to the buyer, unless otherwise agreed to by the parties. Wherever this agreement contains a provision that requires or allows communication, delivery to a seller. That provision shall be satisfied by communication delivery to the broker for the seller, if any. If there is no broker for the seller, that provision may be satisfied only by communication delivery made directly to the seller unless otherwise agreed to by the parties. Now, headings. The section and paragraph headings in this agreement or for convenience only, and are not indicated to identify all of the material in the section which follow them. There shall be no effect whatsoever in determining the right, obligation, or intent of the parties. Special clauses. Let's go to the last page here. On the last page, you will note there are pre-printed addendums and it says the following are attached to be made part of this agreement such as sale and settlement of other property sale and settlement of other property with the right to continue to market sale and settlement of another property contingency with timed kick out sale and settlement of other property addendum there are four of these sale and settlement of another property and you represent a buyer and or a seller especially the buyer, you need to open all of these up and find them and determine which of the four of them apply to the need of your buyer, okay? Appraisal contingency. The appraisal contingency only can be added on a conventional loan. Does anybody remember where or why it's not needed as in a special clause or FHA and VA. Anybody remember that? How about on page four? The FHA VA, if it applies, rectangle on the bottom. That's correct. FHA VA, it's already built in the agreement of sale that it must appraise. Therefore, you do not need an appraisal contingency for FHA and VA. Short sale addendum. Remember, that's when the seller's upside down. The value of their home is less than what is owed out. So there is a special form, plus many other forms that are going to be needed from the bank. Buyer and seller acknowledge receipt of a copy of this agreement at the time of signing. If you're doing this electronically, clearly they have a copy of it. But not always are you doing this, excuse me, electronically. Sometimes you're actually sitting at the dining room table with your buyer and seller. Just bring a blank copy with you so that you will comply with that line in the agreement. This agreement may be executed in one or more counterparts, each of which shall be deemed to be an original and which counterparts together shall constitute one and the same agreement of the parties. Jiminy Christmas, does anybody know what the heck that says? Anybody know what that line means? This agreement may be executed in one or more counterparts. That means that this can be signed by the parties who need to sign it at different times different ways. You could get a wet signature from the wife, but the husband is traveling and he's in London. So you send it over by email, DocuSign or whatever, and he electronically signs it at a different date and in a different way. But that's okay because the two together become one. And the most Recent date is the date of total execution, right? Okay. Notice to the parties, when signed, this agreement is a binding contract. 
Parties to this transaction are advised to consult a Pennsylvania real estate attorney before signing if they desire legal counsel. It clearly says here, Pennsylvania real estate attorney. Just because somebody has Esquire behind their name does not indicate that they're going to understand what this buyer is signing. I use this example and I find a great success with it. If you can correlate real estate with medicine, I have found that the general public seems to understand it better. So for instance, your buyer says, you know what? I'd really like to have an attorney look at this. Oh, absolutely. No problem. Please do. But let me say this. If you're going to have attorney review, please have it reviewed by a real estate attorney. The buyer responds, ah, that's okay. I got my own attorney. Mr. Seller, Mr. Buyer, let, let me ask you this question. And we're doing this as a conversational piece and we're in front of each other. And I notice your right eye is a bit cloudy. Clearly you have a cataract in your right eye. I'm wondering, is your wife's gynecologist the one who's gonna remove that cataract for you? Every time I use that analogy, I get a snicker. And I said, but I don't understand. Is not the gynecologist a physician? Why would the gynecologist not remove your cataract? And then they kind of nod and understand where I'm going. Because somebody has Esquire behind their name, they clearly may not understand the contractual part of this agreement of sale. I personally had interactions with an attorney of a family that I sold multiple people in the family homes. Their one brother was a maritime attorney. A gentleman, an attorney who deals with ships, maritime. He had to come to every single closing, had not a clue what was going on, and would refer to the title company and to me, what is this piece of paper they're signing? But in the minds of those buyers and other family members, an attorney had to be there knowledgeable about the business or not, and clearly he wasn't. He was a maritime attorney. So you can understand how this makes no sense if we don't have the right professional in here. So please make sure if your client, buyer and or seller, are going to obtain legal counsel, it is that of a real estate attorney. Okay. Returning of this agreement and any addendum or a dendi, including returning of electronic transmission, bearing of the signature of all parties, constitutes acceptance by the parties. Now, we have initials that we need here on the buy side. The buyer needs to show an initial that they have received the consumer notice, which you did way back when, when you entered into a buyer agency contract with them and the first time you actually were meeting with them discussing finances and such. Buyer has received a statement of the buyer's estimate of closing costs. Yep, and you got that from the loan institution. Buyer has received deposit money notice. You're going to type that up, and they're going to see where the heck their money's being held. Buyer has received the lead-based paint hazard addendum, which is attached to this agreement of sale. Buyer has received the pamphlet, protect your family from lead in your home. So you have to make sure your buyer has received that. Your buyers will sign and date. Now this whole package and many other forms are gonna go over to the seller. Seller has received a consumer notice as adapted by the State Real Estate Commission. So they too have previewed and received and signed off on something on the sell side. And has received a statement of the estimate of closing costs before signing this agreement. The seller knows and has knowledge of what the cost factor is to sell this property and what they're gonna walk with. And then the two signatures are there. There you go. Now you guys are all fabulous. I will tell you many good real estate agents, newer agents in my years of 
giving this class. We'll take this particular class two and often three times. There is so much to absorb. There is so much legality. There is so much detail in this agreement of sale. You really sharpen your skills by understanding this agreement of sale. So I hope this is May, I'll be doing it again in July. I will be seeing some of you people again. I hope I was helpful. I hope you've learned something. Go in peace. You're done. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, this is the fifth time I've taken this. this really? Is Did it help? Well, I've been in the business for many years, both in the mortgage side and, and the real estate side. And I take this every time it's offered because I always learn something and I learned something a lot from you today. So I thank, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye, guys. Have a good day.